Good morning, and if you're on the East Coast, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at the Empowering Afghans, Reframing the Narrative and Providing Support Summit. I'm Brahmi Khan, the COO of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and we are very proud to be in partnership with the Afghan American Foundation and all of our speakers and panelists on this critical and pressing issue. As Congress and the media have had a number of competing priorities this cycle and since the crisis began, we wanted to take, an op take a moment and, and have the opportunity to refocus the narrative and the conversation on the ongoing crisis, its elements, and how we can properly support and help the Afghan community. MPAC stands with the belief of empowering and not occupying community narratives and lived experiences. So we are incredibly grateful to the Afghan American Foundation uh, and all our speakers and panelists. And it gives me great honor to introduce to you Senior Advisor of the Welcome Allies, of Operation Welcome Allies, Harris Thurin. Thank you so much, Romi. Um, uh, first of all, I, I wanted to go ahead and thank the Muslim Public Affairs Council, uh, who I know quite well um, for, for some years, uh, for um, working together with the Afghan American Foundation and hosting this important conversation. Um, for I think uh, the Muslim Public Affairs Council from day one uh, and Afghan American Foundation uh, have worked together to really try to elevate the voices of Afghan Americans in this conversation around Afghanistan and the post withdrawal um, challenges and difficulties that unfortunately have impacted the people of Afghanistan and those who have fled Afghanistan. Um, today's conversation as part of the summit, as we know the summit is a three day event that's put together by the Afghan American Foundation and the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Uh, Council. Uh, today's conversation, I think, is one of the most acute and important conversation, and that is of uh, the humanitarian crisis and how we respond to that difficulty. We are at a critical juncture in the, um, in, in the history of Afghanistan right now, uh, not only politically, uh, but also in a humanitarian perspective. Um, Afghanistan is going through a difficult time um, as it pertains to access to food, access to clean water, access to health care, and that is as a result of the withdrawal that took place and how that withdrawal happened. Um, and the Afghan people are now suffering uh, as a result of the um, uh, problematic decisions made and policies made uh, that are impacting the lives of average Afghans. Um, and uh, as we see, you know, all of us have seen the very, very challenging images that have come, up, come out from Afghanistan. Most of that was focused on the, um, on the withdrawal and the evacuations. But what we have not really seen and, uh, and the world has not focused on is the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding uh, minute by minute, day by day, hour by hour in front of our eyes. The world is essentially watching 38 million people uh, reach the brink of poverty, of mass poverty, of food shortages, of even starvation. And so for us as an international community, for us as Afghan Americans, Muslim Americans, um, people of conscience in the United States, but all around the world, it is imperative that we now speak and engage and address this issue. We cannot punish the people of Afghanistan for policies and politics that they had no hand in. We cannot punish 38 million people, and we cannot set them up for failure in, ba in the basic necessities of life because of policies um, and politics that they were not responsible for. So today, uh, as part of this, of raising awareness around this issue, of ensuring that we're lift, uplifting voices who are involved in this conversation, we have organized this panel 
with two extremely smart human beings who have been involved in this conversation, who have really spent time studying the crisis and ensuring that they are involved and that the voices um, of Afghans are uplifted uh, in this process. Um, and so we will look at the challenges facing the, um, uh, the health sector, the financial sector, uh, basic access to food and water, um, and how we as communities who have the privilege of being outside uh, can potentially engage in this process, help and ensure that we at least raise the voices, change the narrative around Afghanistan, and ensure that we are looking at this issue through a people-centric lens. We need to move away from looking at the issue of Afghanistan through a counterterrorism lens, through a security lens, through a political lens. Now we have to shift and, and, and change that narrative to make this a people-centric lens. And so that is part of the conversation today. And, and to do that, I have two um, uh, really uh, uh, important and, and, and smart individuals who will hopefully help us guide, uh, guide us through that uh, conversation. First is um, Ms. Uh, Ilaha uh, Omar. Um, Ilaha John is an Afghan American grassroots mobilizer uh, with over 20 years of international development work and on the ground experience in Afghanistan, Haiti, and Kenya with a focus on poverty alleviation, um, disability rights, uh, and awareness and access to healthcare and education. Um, Ilaha has recently co-founded Uplift Afghanistan Fund, um, a charitable fund where impact-driven donors are connected to grassroots um, community-led initiatives uh, that they can trust. Um, uh, Ilaha Jan uh, has, has been involved on the ground in Afghanistan, has worked incredibly uh, hard with, with folks who, uh, who, are, um, who are disabled. Um, uh, and I, I, I just remember that I was actually at a fundraiser with her uh, a couple of years back on that specific uh, cause here in Washington. And so she's been doing this for, for quite a while. Um, so thank you for joining us, Ilaha. And our second, um, uh, second to speaker needs no introduction, Dr. Um, uh, Aziz, uh, Ali Aziz Sultan. He is um, uh, an, a renowned Afghan American. He's the chief of the division of vascular and endovascular neurosurgery uh, in the department of neurosurgery. It is the uh, co-director of the Comprehensive Stroke Center and an associate professor of neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. Um, uh, and that is just his uh, day job and title, but um, Ali has been a critical voice in up uplifting Afghan American narratives and voices. Um, and he has worked with multiple organizations for many years now to ensure that um, a people-centric uh, narrative of Afghanistan is, um, uh, is portrayed in the media amongst Afghan Americans and then amongst the American public at large. So uh, I'm going to ask Ilaha to maybe share some of her experiences um, uh, and perspectives and then Ali, and then we'll have a discussion. We'll have a back and forth. We'll get uh, questions from you all um, and ensure that this is a discussion where we can end by talking about how to do, take some practical steps to help the people uh, of Afghanistan. Um, Ilaha Jan, please. Salam alaikum to everybody. Thank you again for having me um, in the discussion and such an honor to share it with Dr. Sultan. Um, I am an Afghan American. I was born in Afghanistan uh, the night President Taraki was assassinated. We left 40 days old. We fled 40, when I was 40 days old in a very similar fashion to how people are leaving the country today, unfortunately. Um, yes, I was, I've been involved with a grassroots level humanitarian work in Afghanistan for over 20 years now and uh, in, in different ways that Horace John explained earlier. But what that did is after August 15, it's, uh, well, all of us working in Afghanistan, our lives have changed and I think forever changed the unprecedented humanitarian disaster unfolding before us is, um, is, is, is something that I think all Afghan people are very scared and worried about all over the world. Um, 
I was immediately involved naturally with making sure our teams working on the ground were able to function in this new environment, um, in this instability, in this new government. And then uh, decided to start Uplift Afghanistan Fund so that donors had a place where they felt safe to donate and as a team of Afghan experts, um, uh, Uplift Afghanistan has a team of Afghan women, um, mo mostly, and also um, our allies who've worked in Afghanistan, who help us assess the humanitarian disaster unfolding uh, and to, to, to figure out where to put our resources and the donations to. And what we do is we find grassroots organizations on the ground or community-led efforts on the ground and we, we vet them and we support them and we get money to them, which has not been easy these days. But just to give everyone, and, and I know you talked about the, the situation, but 97% of Afghan people will be facing universal poverty by mid next year. Um, 23 million people will, will be in emergency level food insecurity. We have hyperinflation, we have COVID, we have one of the worst droughts in the past 27 years, besides a harsh winter. Um, we have uh, IDPs, we have uh, a, an economy that's paralyzed, that was about 80% reliant on foreign aid, and now that is completely frozen. Um, the executive director of the World Food Program, who recently visited Afghanistan, said it is one of the worst humanitarian disasters in mankind, and Afghanistan over the next six months will be hell on earth. And so, um, as Afghan people around the world are, are trying to figure out how to support, and our allies, I should say, not only Afghan people, but we do have allies, how do we respond? It is, it is overwhelming with the challenges in Afghanistan. And I hope that during this conversation, we can clarify some ways for, for people to help and support this uh, humanitarian disaster. Thank you so much, uh, Elahajan. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, those are vivid, vivid uh, words uh, from the UN when someone says that we will be facing hell on earth in Afghanistan if we don't shift how we view what is happening on the ground. So um, I think for those of us who are thinking through this, it's important to remember those, those words. We, um, uh, you know, in international relations and politics and development, we have this term that says never again when we come to uh, humanitarian crises and genocide and, um, um, but we keep repeating these instances of where we let num we let masses really die either from man-made disasters or natural disasters without us intervening. And I think we need to make sure that we don't do this in Afghanistan or else um, uh, we, will, we will have to live with that. And that is something that um, I don't think many of us want to, to, to live with. Uh, Dr. Sultan, um, I wanna ask you to talk a little bit about uh, your work, but also the acute problem within the health sector uh, in Afghanistan at this point. And thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I was late. I'm running between things at the hospital. It's an honor to share the stage uh, with uh, Mr. Laha. Uh, wonderful things I've heard about you. Thank you, Oris John, for inviting me. Um, allow me to uh, just share my story. I, I'm not an expert on <laughs> health care or politics or anything like that, but maybe there's some lessons um, through this and forgive me if I get long-winded or scatterbrained, it's age setting in. Uh, so, so allow me to share my screen for a second. Um, can you see this? Yeah, so uh, I, I put this title on because this has been a, a, a wonderful uh, group of a young Afghan Americans that have um, th that are born here or young professionals. It's a conference that started a number of years ago and it's grown and grown. Um, and it's really 
brings together young people and their identities and, and, and it, being Afghan and being American and we're sort of in this cross mode and how are we Afghan, how are American, how can we sort of interact. Um, I mentioned them because um, they've been very, very instrumental in, in doing uh, some of this, this, this work. So I, I, I am at one of the top leading institutions. I'm a neurosurgeon here who got my way in by learning some techniques of combining a few different types of specialties. I treat patients with sudden acute problems. Uh, but, but this is who I really am. <laughs> this, is, this is my identity. Like uh, Elo John, Elo John I, I, I left when I was um, six years old when the Russians invaded. Uh, this is a picture I drew when I, when, when I was maybe eight years old when I had gotten to Germany. Um, and um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very, very, very sad to see that history gets repeated over and over and over again in Afghanistan. And uh, the future and the young suffer, uh, right? Um, that's, that's, that's me the day before uh, the, the third one, <laughs> the, the little one. Um, uh, the day before we escaped in the back of a truck and, and left. And, and this is as lucky as it gets, <laughs> uh, right? I came to the U.S. and like most of the Afghans that are, or, or Muslims that are sort of first generation parents working two jobs, janitors, this and that, even though they were physicians before, I luckily found my way into med school somehow and somehow through neurosurgery and eventually um, wanted to find myself and went back to Afghanistan. Um, I was a little bit lost <laughs> and I went and connected um, as soon as I finished with a random person in Afghanistan at uh, Ibn Sino Hospital at the time. Um, I also got a tour of the country. My aunt was the Minister of Health at the time, I think, uh, and got a layout of the land. She, where she was working, didn't need me. Um, and, and so I didn't work with her or her advice or anything like that. I went to the county hospitals. Um, where they were lined with poor, poor, desperate people. Um, and I started to work with these young people and brought instruments into the country. Um, and, and they had instruments from years ago that were all broken. These guys were super smart. I swear they could operate better than me. I, I, I need microscopes to operate here. They could do it with their eyes. Um, they just didn't have resources or tools. Uh, they had training programs, um, and and they were they were really really advanced in a number of different ways. I'll get back to this kid. This this is a this is a child, um, a sixteen year old, a 14, 14 year old who was hit on the head. He came into the hospital. Um, his brother had to take him across town, get CAT scans, um, in in order to. Um, diagnose what was going on. He had to pay two months worth of salary. By the time he came back, the kid had herniated, which means he was moments away from death. Um, they operated on him. He survived, thank God. Uh, but that whole process, um, and here, here's his brother acting as his nurse. The brother was 18. Um, anyway, so I saw a lot of on the ground stuff and a lot of hardship. Um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I tried to think about how to help there. And there was these one-off projects that we used to do. And it was always go there, help, come back, go there, help, come back. And it was very, very incremental. I had a chance to go to school uh, when I got to Boston and became very obsessed with uh, processes. And during COVID, when one week I was operating and one week I was off and one week I was operating. I said, okay, what do we do in their off times? We decided to work with the Harvard global strategy team, um, a global surgery initiative and start to map out I want to start. Um, and uh, in, in doing that, we started to figure out um, where 
the major provinces, where, who had access to healthcare, within what areas and sort of mapped out where they were. And my hopes was at some point to solve the problem for that 16 year old boy, which was who got hit in the head and had to spend so much time to get a CT CAT scan interpreted in Pakistan. And how could you fix that digitally? And, and there's now software, AI, AI software and so forth. So we were exploring this technology education uh, sort of initiative. And we brought together a number of people, people in Boston, people in the World Federation of Neurosurgery, people in Japan, and our, our brothers in Afghanistan. I was able to connect uh, to the same gentleman and now found out that a number of his students were all, at all the provincial hospitals around the country. And sometimes we'd get on Zoom and there'd be no electricity, but they have a cell phone uh, and a candle to talk to, uh, talk through. So we really started to get this group of people together to figure out how to bring in education and technology into the country. Uh, and in doing that, we ma mapped out important provinces, the hospitals there. See, the thing is, if you solve for neurosurgery, the workflow processes are the same for trauma surgery, for OBGYN, for pediatric emergencies, and for a country that has the second highest rate of death through trauma, uh, has the highest infant mortality rate like of, of anywhere in the world, um, it, it, it's important. During this project to bring all these centers together to map out Afghanistan's public healthcare systems, not places where you go and get price gouged, the, the government changed. Uh, and in that, there was conflict and there was immediate need for things. Um, these, these are text messages uh, from people there. This is just during the, 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 the airport incident where there was bombings and so forth. And um, they were taking patients and there weren't instruments or anything like that. So through AACO, we started fundraising and then through the World Federation of Neurosurgery in Spain, we were able to purchase $700,000 worth of equipment uh, for a fraction of the price. And through our partners in Pakistan uh, and the universities there, we were able to use a pharmaceutical company to actually take uh, these instruments and start to disperse them around all of these 10 different centers. These are instruments that literally are to open the skull so you can take out bullet fragments or blood or things that are life and death type of things. So we're able to get these sort of life-saving equipment that will last for decades uh, to, the, to the major public hospitals that people have access to. Um, there were a number of challenges, and maybe this is where the lesson comes in. Um, and and w one of the things was that I'd, I had been working with good people on this up until the point where the government um, collapsed. And the first thing that we heard uh, was from our own teams, we need to kill this project. We're not supporting a terrorist government, right? And I said, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, the terrorists have taken over. We're not supporting this. We can't. I said, what, what are you talking about? It's the same doctors that we've been on the Zoom calls with for the past six months. It, it's the same human beings that they're treating that are probably much worse off than they were before. How, how, what, is, what does this mean? What, what do you mean we're killing this project? And thank God I was able to jump a couple of steps over and understand, get to people who understood what a humanitarian uh, effort is. And, and as, as, as a caring human being, <laughs> as a doctor and as a Muslim, what it means to do no harm. Uh, it's not like what Joan said, it's not 
the 16 year old's fault that the government changed, uh, <laughs> you know. So that was one of the main challenges that this perception that if you continue humanitarian work at this time, you're, you're, you're supporting a government. Uh, the second thing was the logistics. There was no way to get things in, uh, no way to help. <laughs> All you hear is one-sided things in the news and no way to actually help people that are at the bottom of the well. Like, how, how do you get there? And we had to figure out routes and a number of different routes were closed off. I'm a neurosurgeon, I'm not a <laughs> logistical, the lay per, like, and, and the governments are shut down, there's sanctions and people are dying, right? And it's all under this one umbrella. Imagine if everybody judged us by, maybe I shouldn't get political, but what if everybody judged us by the, the previous Trump administration like, <laughs> and, and, and cut us off? Um, so since that time, the instruments were the first effort, right? The second effort is to digitally activate all of these hospitals so that they can have education, they can be telemedicine, they can, we can layer some of these next level technologies, whether it's robotics or AI and so forth, and education, right? Allowing people to speak. This is, this is one of the young neurosurgeons uh, presenting at the Japanese World Conference. So they're, they're very, very smart. She's presenting on pediatric and penetrating gunshot wounds. I, I think certain sectors need to remain wide, wide open. Otherwise we get back into the situation that we did in the, in the 90s. And a lot of these thoughts came into my head as I was sitting in class one day. Uh, it, this is called the Social Product Progress Index that came out of MIT and it's sort of used. We have to concentrate not to sorry, go too far down the tiers, right? The, every society is based on four fundamental things. Food, <laughs> safety, shelter, and access to health care. Tier one, tier one. Not, not necessarily democracy, not necessarily education, not those basic things for survival. Th then comes education and all of the other things that we enjoy. But to say that this isn't in a line and we're just gonna cut off the basic premises is what leaves people hurt uh, and desperate uh, and, and, and a vacuum. Uh, the whole point of this initiative, and this is the last slide, was in these times, you, you, you know, people my age come and go and it doesn't matter, right? But if you starve the children, you, 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 you take away their access to medical care, you're choking the entire future of a country. You can never build to what you want. If, 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 if the seeds are, are, are destroyed. So I don't know if this was a rant or maybe outside of the scope, but- uh, This was great, it was, it was wonderful. I think your personal experience, uh, uh, Dr. Sultan, and actually um, having worked in Afghanistan in that, uh, in the healthcare sector, you, you, you really have that um, um, a personal experience and what some of the challenges are right now and so thank you for that. I think that was extremely helpful and thank you for making it personal. And I think one of the challenges when we talk about, you know, part of this uh, summit, um, the title of the summit is reframing the narrative and providing support. I think unfortunately what happens with Afghanistan, the conversation around Afghanistan, the, even the humanitarian conversation is so politicized. It's all about politics. It's all about regional dynamics. It's all about um, international dynamics. And, and, and so 
the humanity and the personal touch is lost in that conversation. And so when you're on Twitter and when you're on, when Afghanistan is in the media, it's all about these, you know, political dynamics, but the human toll and cost is not part of the conversation. And thank you for making that part of the conversation. I just want to ask a couple of questions. I also want to encourage the audience, please do type in your uh, questions if you have any for um, uh, for uh, Ms. Omar and, and, uh, and Mr. Sultan. Um, any questions that you might have in terms of the uh, current crises, um, please do go ahead and, uh, and uh, type those in and we'll make sure to ask those questions from the uh, panelists. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you uh, to Elaha John, um, what in your opinion is right now the most critical challenge um, in Afghanistan? Is it just, you know, is it access to food? Is it the financial crisis? Is it uh, access to uh, uh, to uh, to money and, and cash. And um, uh, so what, in your opinion right now, if you can talk a little bit about that, because people are also saying, so why are people in such dire need if we're talking about the 97% of the population on the brink of, of, of uh, mass poverty? What is causing all of this? Well, the cause was that 80% of the country uh, budget expenditures were dependent on foreign aid, and now that is frozen, okay? That is the leading cause. You have a um, de facto government that has not governed before. And uh, well, there's a lot of problems with that. There's also a tremendous amount of infighting and you have sanctions. So people sending money to Afghanistan uh, with the banking crisis as well. You, we had a run on the banks, and a, a huge liquidity issue. So you have this government, you have this cash crisis, and you have unfolding, basically, if the middle class are now be begging for food, imagine those who lived hand to mouth. They've just literally been pushed over the edge. And so the challenge, these, were the cha these are the challenges, and what should we focus on? Uh, what we're focusing on, for example, is food distribution of food, food, winter supplies, and medicine. So um, we're working with a few grassroots and community-led organizations and to get access to the ultra poor. Mm -hmm. And to get access to the ultra poor, you need to have a relationship with the community leaders. So we're finding ways to engage and empower these through CDC's community development councils. Um, that had already existed through other programs, uh, national priority programs in Afghanistan, and re-engaging with them to see, okay, uh, these are the areas we're mapping out that require, emer well, the whole country is in an emergency state, but there are some areas that the winter has started really harshly for them. So to get access to them, we need to be engaged with those community leaders that can get access, that have the, done the assessment work, that understand the, the political situation, that can um, work around the challenges. And there are many challenges, many, but, there, but we, that is no reason to hold back from, oh, will the money get to the people? Yes, part of it will go to other costs or what I'm saying by other costs is, you know, there's a hawala fee, like that's how we're sending money in top on us. There's a hawala fee. That's how it is. You know, um, it's a 3% fee, but th that's, that's what it is. Um, there's some operational costs for organizations on the ground, buying gas, you know, feeding the, the team leaders and the, the people who are actually the brave people who are actually doing the distributions of food. But, um, but we are, we are doing it and so far we've had several distributions and we're trying to access at least 10,000 people in the next three weeks. Um, and I'm happy to, to address if there's anybody with organizations that they want to, they're, they're lost on how to get help into Afghanistan. I'm happy to direct people. I'm happy to share my challenges. Um, there's, you know, there's OFAC where there are many people who are sanctioned. Um, so I have a process where I clear people that I hawala or the recipients from the SDN list. So, you know, we, we have to, uh, as leaders, 
who are familiar with Afghanistan, who I was just there June and July, I've been traveling there for the past 20 years. I feel like it's my responsibility to kind of clear that path for people who are in question on how do we respond to the crisis, which crisis? And again, to answer the question, I think it's food or I think it's funds, um, somehow just getting either of those two to Afghan people and whatever, you know, in, in whatever uh, province or village that you can is the way to respond in the short-term process. In the long-term process, that's a different subject, but we have a crisis at hand and we need to respond to that. And, and something that you brought up before I go to Dr. Sultan, uh, something that you brought up that I think I, I hear from a lot of people. Every single day I get, I'm getting calls from people who are saying, they're kind of frozen as to what to do. They don't know what to do at this point because they're realizing I can't send money on Western Union. So I had a call yesterday where someone said, I need to send money. I need to figure it out. Western Union won't allow me to send money. Um, I can't, uh, there's, there's not a lot of aid organizations that are actually accepting money right now for Afghanistan because they're not able to uh, disperse at least here from the United States. And so people feel at a loss. They don't know where to go. And I think uh, maybe addressing that a little bit about how, what, what can people do at this point? So are there organizations that they can support? Uh, and maybe we can highlight some of that at the end, but I, I feel like people are really at a loss. They don't know what to do. This is true. This is true. And there are organizations like Uplift. There's a, a wonderful app called A Seal and they're doing things um, through this app and, and people can do their own fundraising campaigns and they have people. The trick is having people, trusted people on the ground in Afghanistan. When you have that, um, yes, uh, the banks are allowing a minimal withdrawal, uh, both Western Union and MoneyGram, also a minimum. I was sending $5,000 once Western Union had opened up every transaction. And then all of a sudden it shut down again because of the cash uh, situation. And then now I'm sending increments of two to 400. But again, that's not if you want to you know, really uh, support a bigger effort. Uh, although I have to say, I believe everyone can contribute in some way. I had an uh, email today of somebody who said, Allaha, I just want to help one family. I want to take responsibility for one family in Afghanistan. Can you help me find a family? Absolutely. I know many. Um, I can connect the family and they can send $100 a month directly through Western Union uh, or MoneyGram and that family will be okay um, to get them through, especially get them through the winter. Um, for people who have collected big donations, I would suggest finding a reliable Hawaladar, either in UK, uh, Canada, or Dubai or UAE, um, I've, I have a few, I've vetted them, I've cleared them off of the OFAC SDM list and um, it's working. It was the old way it was happening and, and now it's, it's working. It's not, it doesn't make me feel 100% you know, uh, comfortable, but as long as you trace the money, all the way from beginning to end, and you can show where your money went um, based from the lawyers that I've spoken to, uh, that's, that's fine. I mean, we're not, there's nothing illegal going on, even though Hawala business is illegal in the US. But to uh, send a Hawala through a legal entity is fine. Thank you for that. That's that's really helpful. I think a lot of people are really struggling with how to respond. Uh, Dr. Sultan, so winter is coming, uh, or winter is really, it's here in Afghanistan. Um, uh, and we know that Afghanistan um, does have a harsh winter for a couple of months. Um, I was speaking to a young kid who was here, who was able to evacuate and come to the, to the US. Um, and he started, when I started to talk to him, he just broke down and started crying. And I said, what, what's going on? He said, I can't feel safe here in the US because I don't think my family will be able to afford wood to burn for heat this winter. That is the level of, of challenges and, and what people are thinking. 
So when it comes to winter and the difficulties, um, which probably exasperates the health challenges and conditions, what do you see right now as the biggest challenges in terms of the health sector? Um, where is it lack of actual physicians? Is it access to care? Uh, where do you see that right now in the next few months, especially with the uh, with the uh, humanitarian, the food crisis, the cash crisis? What is going on right now? What are those challenges? Well, the the again, I'm not an expert on this <laughs> at all, but but I can tell you some of the things that we've. Uh, faced. Uh, remember, we were working with these doctors before, yeah. during, and now. Uh, and some of the challenges uh, include opportunity to education. And, and these are not immediate things. These are things that will realize themselves in five to seven years. Uh, um, when there was a change, there was a massive sort of fleeing uh, of like us, my parents were doctors. We yeah. fled the country, so who's going to take care of the? So a number of the neurosurgeons that we had been working for, and there's 74 neurosurgeons in Alwana Stone, <laughs> uh, fled, uh, fled, uh, right, rightfully so. You can't blame them, but then those people don't have access to that anymore. So there's this drain, drain, drain drainage <laughs> that, that that happens. Um, and then there's a resource issue, like just, just basic surgical instruments. They're using things from 30, 40 years ago. But even more important than the surgical thing, like neurosurgery is this, like what Ila, John is talking about in terms of medications and basic sort of necessities. All of that is linked to the economy, right? <laughs> All of that. So you, if you send... 5,000 or 10,000 uh, one year or whatever, and the egg costs, <laughs> ten, it, it's, all, it's, all, it's all linked. And every time you talk humanitarian, because of Afghanistan being in war for 40 years, it spills over to politics because the country is really, really dependent. They've been, with no fault of their own, <laughs> they've been made to be dependent on outside resources. And if you choke that, how many blankets can I send into the country, uh, right? And, and we're repeating the same things that happened in, in, in the 90s when this government was in the first place. Is there a different way to think so we're not in the same positions again? <laughs> <laughs> right. So now I've gone way beyond my expertise. Right. So for me, it's I have instruments waiting in, in China and we can't get them in and, and medications and so forth because of the they can't limit Kabul logistical things. Certain provinces no longer have the types of physicians that I have certain places. Um, people don't have money. Uh, the physicians I'm talking to are the most privileged people, right? There's yeah. a professor that came to the hospital, an pro engineering professor, asking for a job to mop the floors. Like, <laughs> and that's probably the best of it. There's, you've all heard the stories of, and some of those are real. I've seen pictures of people selling anything and everything that they have in order to feed their children. Private donors aren't going to solve that issue. It's, it's, it's up to the, yeah. the issue with Afghans there and Afghans here is that we have separate voices and separate identities. And there's, multiple Afghan organizations doing multiple things. We need to band to, together in some sense and have one directive. Um, I, I don't know how to accomplish that. I can tell you all the challenges. I can tell you what I'm trying to do, but I can tell you that's probably not even a drop. Uh, yeah. No, and, and, I, and I think uh, what, the point, I think the point that I'm hearing from you is that everything is interconnected right now. 
you can't separate the humanitarian crisis and the financial crisis from the political crisis. They're intertwined at this point. Um, and I think that's, that's part of changing the narrative is to say, this is, we have to focus on the people because if the people are not priority at this point, then, then you know, we're gonna get caught up in the political aspect of this and the security component of this and people will be the victims, which is usually the case. And so that's what I'm hearing from you, Dr. Sultan. And I, and I hear that fr the frustration that I hear in your voice is the frustration that I hear in so many people's voices who, who I speak to around the country of, about this issue. People are just frustrated. They don't know how to move forward. So um, Elahajan, in, in your perspective, like this interconnectedness between the policy and the humanitarian issue and the financial, what do you think are some of the um, solutions that we can think about or some of the things that we can do to try to help the situation? Um, being here in the US, um, you know, being a bit removed from what's happening on the ground, what do you think that we can do? Uh, of course, number one, we talked about, and you talked about immediate fund, funding, donors collecting donations and money to be able to get, what else do you think that we can do to try to help lessen the burden on the people of Afghanistan? Well, um, yeah, like I said, addressing the immediate need of food and medicine and um, funds um, is one. Um, we're in an interesting time now because of technology. Um, and there are some innovative uh, advances we've made. For example, um, there is a, for, for education, there's an app called Maktab. So for those kids who are not able to go to school, they could actually, through the use of a smartphone, access the same curriculum on their phone at home, given they have uh, electricity to uh, charge their phone. Uh, there's another like financial mobile banking um, systems that are enable uh, wages to be paid um, to hospitals, to doctors, uh, to doctors, to hospitals, because that's a huge problem. Teachers are not getting paid, right? Um, physicians and doctors. And by the way, I'm shocked to find out that the average salary of a physician in Afghanistan is between two to three hundred dollars. A month. Yeah. The, uh, one of our physicians was knocked down to a hundred and uh, didn't um, in, in Kabul. Um, we need to support the infrastructure. So a lot of people are worried about well, and and they have a right to well. How do you deal with a, a country that's governed by the Taliban? That's sanctioned. That's this, and we don't trust. And well, contact the hospitals directly. Contact the schools directly. See how you can support them. For example, there are a tremendous amount of orphanages in Afghanistan. Um, they don't have food. Uh, I know an orphanage that we support through one of our uh, organizations that I volunteer for, ECI. Uh, they basically, the kids were eating crackers for days on days until one of the workers called uh, our other orphanage and said, can you guys help? So uh, finding a way to ship food into the country. And mind you, everything I'm saying, because I'm a humanitarian crisis kind of response is, is a, more of like a, a, a quick response. There are, are policy changes. There are UN talks, there's IMF talks. There needs to be some kind of, you know, a negotiation of conditional funds uh, distribution to the government or at least to the government employees, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of picking and choosing my battles. And right now it's how to create, how to clear that pathway for people who want to immediately respond to the crisis. Yeah. No, and, and that's really important because I don't think people understand how much of, uh, the average citizens depend on government salaries in Afghanistan. Yeah, there is a strong, there is a strong private sector, definitely was, a, was, was well, there was a decent private sector. The aid sector, as you mentioned, Lahajan, is completely done now. There are only a few international aid organizations, maybe like IOM or, or IRC that are still functioning uh, and not at full capacity. Most people were reliant on their government salaries, right? Absolutely. And so, the biggest yeah. employer was the government. And now 
they have not had wages now, I would say for at least five months. Again, when those middle-class families are suffering now, you can imagine the poor people in the rural areas. Uh, uh, Dr. Sultan, how is that working with, with nurses and, and hospital staffs and not just maybe even physicians? They haven't been paid in months. Like, how are they dealing with that? Yeah. Uh doctors and so forth, especially a number of the ones that we've been talking to, like I said, are sort of within the privileged sector of society and they're essential workers. So they've been allowed to function as they do. Um, nurses and women doctor are continuing to, to work, uh, maybe segregated in some senses and so forth. But there have been salary cuts. There have been people that have been cut off uh, for, for, from working. And, and uh, I remember the, the, the friend that I have there that I met randomly before. The last time uh, this government was in place, he worked for two years without a salary. His students told me that. So there's only a certain <laughs> amount of appetite for that before your family starts to suffer. Um, I, I, think, I think, as we all said, there's a desperate need and impending humanitarian crisis if it's not already happening. Yeah. And to, to have conversation like this about us changing the narrative instead of judging a country that has been in 40 years of war to keep them to our standards, which we can't, that scale that I showed you, the United States is 38th, by the way, <laughs> 38th. So to, to, to uphold a country that's been in 40 years of war to the standards here and then punish them because they're not meeting certain things, punishes the poorest of the poor, not who's in government. Uh, Wait, we have to... the poor, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I have Please. witnessed this that the minority communities, the people living with disabilities, women, they always pay, or and the ultra poor, they always pay the biggest price. Mm -hmm. And we have to be conscious of all these decisions and these you know, uh, policy and politics, how our actions affect those people. And I think that is key because, because th that is not the conversation that's happening in the media. That is not the conversation that's happening in the media, right? right? The conversation about in the media is about regional dynamics in the US and China and Russia and Pakistan and Iran and what's going to happen in the security situation and terrorism and counterterrorism, which is a conversation that needs to be had. But the voices, the, uh, the, the stories of people who are impacted by those policies that they had absolutely nothing to do with, right? Um, and overnight, I mean, Afghanistan had, was a very struggling um, uh, you know, economy and state, but people at least had a certain level of that access to food, certain level of access to education, um, you know, but all of that flipped overnight. I mean, the level of shock and trauma, we haven't even talked about the mental health impact of all this, right? The oh. impact on, on children and, and not being able to access school. It's just, there is so much that we haven't even talked about. We're just talking about the basics, as uh, Dr. Sultan said, of, of food, of shelter, of you know, access to healthcare. Those are just, just the basics. And what really hurts me is that 20 years later, we're back at this conversation. After billions and billions of hundreds of billions of dollars of investment, we're back at this such the same conversation that we were having in 1996 and 97. And I think I, whatever we can do to see if we can impact that process, I think is key for us. What are your thoughts on that? We also need to reclaim the aid ecosystem as well. I know we're responding to a crisis and that's difficult, but you know we became dependent on aid and that is a problem with aid. Um, mm -hmm. And we need to start reconfiguring or changing that narrative again and, and planning and strategizing for self-sustainable Afghanistan, not a dependent Afghanistan. I know it's gonna take a while. I understand that when I talk like this, people are like, Allah, what are you talking about? 
People are starving to death. I understand. But if we have that vision, we can work towards it. Yeah. And, and so to that question, so when we, we talk about um, an aid-dependent economy that was set up, you know, uh, after 2001, a lot of people will respond. And so they'll tell me, well, Afghanistan has always been dependent on international aid for the past hundred years. Um, why, 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 do you, why do you have this conversation? Uh, can you address as to why that needs to shift? Sure. Dr. Sultan, do you want to go? Or... <laughs> so, well, I mean, yes, uh, there's a reason for aid dependency. I mean, you've seen it in, in Africa, for example. Um, we've, we have been, we are a poor country, but obviously that's all been compounded by uh, foreign intervention in Afghanistan. And, uh, and I have to say with aid, you know, people throw out really big numbers a lot about aid and, you know, aid, uh, the actual distribution of aid versus the allocation of aid in Afghanistan has been very different figures, you know, um, and I think there's whole notion of aid has been something that's extremely controversial and never transparent enough that people don't understand, you know, these projects that were that, you know, a lot of people are like, well, we just spent, you know, billions of dollars, but what did you spend it on? Really? How much was spent on this? How much, how much was spent on costs, mm. operational costs of these big fancy programs, right? Or the security part of it. And so there's a lot of, these are the conversations that we need to have now so that for this next generation of support in Afghanistan, which it's going to need, we just again have that vision of self-sustainable Afghanistan and we work towards that however long that takes us. Dr. Sultan? You're, 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 you're back in, in, <laughs> in, in 96 or whenever this happened last time. And you've seen all the mistakes that played out that led to the terrorist notion that Afghans aren't terrorists. Afghans don't commit outside. What lessons can you learn? Like you, you literally have a rewind. <laughs> yeah. A lot of our young weren't around back then in <laughs> social media, Twitter, it's, it's a different but you have a reset, have a people focused approach. I don't know how the politics works, but a humanitarian, concentrate on those four building blocks, <laughs> safety, healthcare, food, shelter, the basics of a human being, like concentrate on that and build policies around that. And inshallah in 10, 20 years, we'll have a different place. Um, and if you all are comfortable sharing your contact information, we're getting questions if they could, if folks can um, connect with you all. I think there's questions about how to maybe deliver aid and specifically yourself, Dr. Sultan, in terms of how they can help you um, with some of the medical work that you're doing. So if you're able to uh, share maybe an email address on the chat box, please do so. I, people are asking to, uh, to, to get in touch with you all. So thank you so much for, for doing that. Um, as, as I want to kind of wrap up the conversation because I think it's been um, it, it, it's been wonderful. Thank you both for, for doing this. Um, do you? I, I want to give both of you maybe a little bit of time to um, to end with some reflections um, and also thinking about the fact that uh, most of the people on here are not um, Afghan Americans. Uh, there are allies, right? There are Afghan American allies, and part of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, even hosting this was to get other people into this conversation. Um, and maybe even talk a little bit about what our allies uh, can do in terms of supporting this uh, this cause and ensuring that, that they stand with the people of Afghanistan. Because as history teaches us, uh, what happens in Afghanistan does not stay in Afghanistan. Uh, that's just the reality. Um, and so maybe, Elahjan, if you can start with some reflections and then yourself, Dr. Sultan. Yeah, um, a big thanks to our allies. There are a lot of people who really, uh, non-Afghans who stepped up uh, during these evacuations, during uh, this humanitarian crisis, locally receiving refugees. And I, again, I said this during the call, everybody 
can contribute in, in some way. And um, I, encourage, I encourage you all to keep this conversation about Afghanistan alive. Um, I encourage you all in your communities, within your families, to um, find ways to contribute. It could be providing a uh, in-kind distribution. It could be providing a service to help an Afghan NGO build a logo. I mean, it could be financial. There's, there's a plethora of ways that we can, that our allies can support the Afghan communities. Um, and I, and there's a, uh, there are many resettlement organizations locally and all over um, uh, the US uh, that you know we could probably make a list of um, a lot of organizations that I've worked closely with in Afghanistan. I will be doing that on Uplift, creating um, um, after we vetted our partners, creating, uh, allowing um, the world to see who we vetted and who we trust and who other people can trust. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Sultan. Some closing reflections from yourself. Uh, I, I, I was searching for what to say, and your your title, uh, reframe the narrative, right? Instead of instead of having a fear based approach and a narrative, if you could reframe that into a humanitarian and loving and supporting and solving problems for the most desperate. Right? That's what America is known for. That's why we ran to this country in, 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 in the 80s when the Russians, I used to think that there's toys all over the streets, like we were desperately running here. Let's, let's get back to that. That was a time and a place where the United States led with kindness and leadership and supporting things. I think we're just hurting the the weakest of the weak with, with with what's out there today. Let's be brave and take a different approach. Thank you for that, and and uh, I, I really want to thank both of you for joining this conversation. It, it's been recorded, and and we want to make sure that we get this out to as many people as possible. I think you're right, Dr. Sultan. It really is about reframing the narrative, and as um, you know, as uh, uh, Maulana Rumi uh, from Balkh uh, in Afghanistan, who you know, who constantly spoke about love um, and and humanity, and I think the most famous poet in the world. I think what we need to do is reframe our narrative on Afghanistan right now. It needs to be about humanity. It needs to be about compassion. It needs to be about love, but we also need to be pragmatic in how we do that and, and try to bring folks. Um, and this is not coming from a place of idealism and being idealistic. It really is a changing that narrative to a more human and people centric conversation. And the more we do that, the more we uh, bring in allies um, in, in this operation that I've been a part of as, as we're integrating so many people, almost 80,000 people now into the US. I've seen that best of America that you were talking about, Dr. Sultan. I've, last night, I was with someone who has taken uh, four young girls in their early 20s uh, into their home and are putting them through college and, and ensuring that their families, even back in Afghanistan, have access to, um, uh, to uh, food and, and education and all of that. So we really need to dig deep, uh, dig deep into ourselves and our, uh, our communities and, and, and do that. And so please continue to join in the next couple of days until December 9th, the different, um, uh, the different conversations the next ones will be about the various challenges, some of the political challenges, social challenges, uh, foreign policy challenges, continue to join for the next couple of days. And thank you again for uh, the Muslim Public Affairs Council and the Afghan American Foundation for hosting this conversation. Uh, and, to, and a special thank you to our panelists um, uh, for being with us. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.